I believe this is an appetite for God and his standards and his way of doing things. Versus, say, the second chapter of Ecclesiastes. Got your Bible? Let's look. We suspect Solomon wrote the second chapter of Ecclesiastes. Wrote the first chapter. Wrote it all. But it's interesting. You remember Solomon. Uh, one day, God says, what do you want, Solomon? I'll give you anything. By the way, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when that comes around? I'll give you anything. i got to tell you, too, many, too much of the time i got a dollar amount, a dollar amount in mind. Really, anything? What could $10 billion do for Matt Freedom? I mean, that's an incredible offer from God. I'll give you anything. By the way, this is another Yuri moment. I asked Yuri one time, I said, Yuri, uh, did he ask for the wrong, or did he, yeah, did he ask for the wrong thing? Remember what he asked for? Wisdom. What? Wisdom. Wisdom. Discernment. God gave him wisdom and discernment. I said, did he ask for the wrong thing? He said God was pleased, but he didn't say God said he picked the very best thing. What should he have asked for? Did he pick the right thing? You said, I don't think so. You said, I said, what, what should he have asked for? He said, he should have asked for the presence of God. Now, Yuri is about ten times smarter than I am. Can I say? I think he was wrong. I think, I think the better thing to have asked for would have been the love of God every moment the rest of my life. The love of God. I think you and I can pick out instances where the presence of God was there and they disobeyed anyway. Can you ever imagine someone around Jesus disobeying? Apparently Judas was doing it most every day. Judas was in the presence of God almost every day and he was pilfering money. I said, but the love of God? Ooh, that puts us on a whole different plane, doesn't it? Did Solomon ask for the wrong thing? Well, it didn't end up well for him. Because Ecclesiastes, I think, is a pretty good, in some ways, a pretty good summation of what happened to him. The key word there is hevel. Say that word with me, hevel. 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 And hevel is one of the Old Testament words for breath. But there's another one, ruach. And ruach is the breath, the wind, the spirit of God. It's the same kind of thing that happened in Ezekiel 37. When the breath, the wind, the spirit of God, the ruach of God, comes upon those dry bones and brings them to unbelievable... Lord's army life, right? But here's heaven. And heaven's this. Everybody look up. Solomon's saying, See anything? Nope. You don't see nothing. That's my life. Ain't nothing there. He says, verse 2, Hevel, hevel, utterly hevel, everything is hevel. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. Empty, empty, breath in the wind, breath in the wind. That's my life. We kind of tell all good stories about Solomon. I think Solomon is the most disastrous personality in the Bible. He asked for wisdom, and this is how he ended up. Chapter 2. I fought in my heart. Come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. That proved to be meaningless. Verse 4, and quickly through verse 8. So, I build houses. I planted vineyards. had gardens, parks, fruit trees, water grows of flourishing trees. I had male and female slaves. I had flocks. I amassed silver and gold, the treasure of kings and provinces. I had men and women singers. I had a harem. I had a thousand women in my life. I had it all. I did it my way. Yeah, then look at the first four words of verse 17. So I hated life. Because the work that was done under the sun was grievous to me. It's all just meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So, we're talking about hungering and thirsting for that? Gardens? Parks, fruit trees. He was given wisdom, and with that wisdom, he said, Let me get a harem. He was given wisdom, and he said, 
I want me some fruit trees. He was given wisdom. He said, I want the silver and gold of kings and provinces. He was given wisdom. And he said, I want me some more cows. Oh, my. Jesus says, hunger and thirst for that. And your life will be meaningless too. But hunger and thirst for me, for my righteousness, for my holiness, for my standards, and you will be blessed. Now I love what John Wesley says about this thing. He says, righteousness to the world implies three things. By the way, look at these three things. He says, this is the world's understanding. I'm thinking the world's understanding. He says, number one, the doing of no harm, abstaining from outward sin. Right? Uh, Righteous to the world is the doing of good, being charitable at its call. Righteous to the world is going to church and to the Lord's Supper. That's the world's righteousness. Or that's how they understand it. But this is not the righteousness that someone can really hunger and thirst for. He can be no more fed on this poor, shallow, formal thing than he can fill his belly with the east wind. This is only the outside of that religion which he insatiably hungers for. What we really want in our heart of hearts, John Wesley noted, was the life which is hid with Christ in God. Oh, you want the life of Jesus is what you want. Uh, being joined together with the Lord in one spirit. Having fellowship with the Father and the Son. Walking in the light as God is in the light. Being purified even as He is pure. I mean, you want righteousness? And notice how Wesley from Scripture speaks of the topic in terms of communion. Hid with God, joined together with God, having fellowship with God, walking as God, purified as He is purified. And Wesley said, you know the first three Beatitudes we just went over? Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. He says, when you take those first three Beatitudes seriously, they ought to root out pride and frivolity and thoughtlessness. And once they're removed, these evil diseases of the soul which were continually raising false cravings therein and filling with sickly appetites, the native appetite of a heaven-born spirit returns. And guess what? That appetite hungers and thirsts after righteousness. <clears throat> wow! You ever heard how to kill a wolf? I don't know anything about this. Alaska woman can tell me. <laughs> wolf. They say, up in the northern country, lots of snow. They say that you can run after wolves all day long because there's a lot of them and shoot them. I saw Sarah Palin doing this not too long ago. <laughs> Went up in helicopters and just start plugging away at them. <laughs> Kill them dead. You can do that. Helicopter's kind of expensive. Takes a lot of <laughs> shotgun shells, whatever you're shooting them with. You know, it's kind of expensive. So what else could be done here? Ah, they say. There's another method. Take a knife. Put in blood, let it freeze. Put in blood again, let it freeze. Put in blood again, let it freeze. Pretty soon you have a blood popsicle. Put it in the ground. Make sure it's weighted into the ground. And a wolf, some night when you're sleeping, will smell out the blood. Will come up and will start licking that blood. So they well, can believe it. Can you believe it? Never had a blood popsicle. That's pretty good. And starts putting the tongue next to it. Now, the wolf is carnivorous, so he kind of likes what happened next. Because what happens next is. He licks and licks and licks and licks and finally gets down to the blade. You ever done a popsicle thing before? Kind of makes your mouth go numb, right? Oh. Makes your tongue go numb? Mm -hmm. Well, his... Yeah, 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 I know. This is your country we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon, that tongue is going against the blade. Pretty soon, blood in his mouth. And pretty soon, he's as happy as he can be. This is the best thing that happened to him all week long. Then he starts feeling a little bit weak and says, I better go find Mama. And so the next day, Eskimo gets up, goes out to the place where the knife is, sees a knife. It's a knife now, it's not a popsicle. And just follows the blood to the dead wolf. Which is another way of saying, your appetite will kill you. Solomon's appetite killed him. Or your appetite can bring life. <laughs> the greatest life anybody could ever know. And that's what we're looking for, isn't it? The abundant life. 